Welcome to our webinar today about accessing and interpreting biodiversity information for high level biodiversity screening. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment for making informed decisions. Today's presentation is part of a webinar program that IAIA initiated last year. I invite you to check it out and visit our website. You'll see uh, recordings that you can look at on demand of our past webinars. You'll see some there on the topics of health and psychosocial impact assessment. Um, also, on uh, we had one on the Canadian Impact Assessment Act that's been proposed recently. So you can check them all out there on the website URL at iaia.org slash webinars. And also, if you feel like um, sharing some information of the great details you're going to be getting today, um, IAIA's Twitter handle is IAIA Network, or you can use the hashtag IAIA Webinar. We do have just a bit of housekeeping before we get started today. Uh, we will be recording the session and we will make that available to you all. Uh, you will receive an email in a day or two with the link to the recording as well as to the slides and the handout that they have made available for you. If you have questions at any time throughout the webinar, please go ahead and enter them in the questions pane that you'll see in your GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. Enter them at any time. We'll be having a Q&A session at the end. And um, there is also a pane that says handouts, and you can go ahead and click on there right now if you'd like to download the a PDF of the slides or the handout that they made available. You will also receive a link to those when you get the link to the recording as well. So our first presenter today is Dr. Eugenie Regan. She has worked with biodiversity data for over 15 years. She's uh, worked at the national and international level in both the private and the public sector. Most recently, she served as a consultant in impact assessment with the biodiversity consultancy. Currently, she's a manager for IBAT, the integrated biodiversity assessment tool. And you'll be learning lots more details about that later on in the webinar today. Our second presenter is Nadine McCormick. She is a program officer in the IUCN's Business and Biodiversity Program. She's responsible for mobilizing knowledge to reinforce civil society capacity to better engage the private sector in transforming business biodiversity practices. With nearly 15 years of experience in both the private and not-for-profit sector, Nadine brings expertise, energy, and vision to multi-stakeholder processes. And so now I will turn the presentation over to Jenny to get us started. Thank you very much, Bridget. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. It's a real honor to be talking to IAIA. Um, yeah, so I'll just get, get started. So I'd like to firstly um, thank you for responding to the questions that we posed to you when you registered for the webinar. As of yesterday, we had 268 respondents, and I think almost now, um, Bridget, and Rupa, 300 people have registered for the webinar. So that's fantastic. And thank you for answering our questions. So you responded, so firstly, as part of your work, you include information on protected areas, key biodiversity areas, and red list of species. And the tools you use to access these data include IUCN websites, including the red list website, IUCN's red list website, government databases, Protected Planet, which is the website for the world database on protected areas, Google Earth, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and also other government portals such as Canabio, which is a Mexican Biodiversity Information Facility, and SANBI, which is a South African National Biodiversity Institute. And then we asked you, well, how familiar are you with IBAT? And um, it was great for us to know, because this is useful um, why we're doing this webinar, that 58% of you are not at all familiar with IBAT, 32% have limited familiarity, and 10% are quite or very familiar. So delighted that we um, are doing this webinar then to increase people's awareness of IBAT, but also for those of you that already know about IBAT, we're going to talk to you firstly just about 
biodiversity data itself and using it in risk screening. And then secondly, we have a new portal and you are the first people to see our plans and ideas for the new portal. So even if you're quite familiar with IBAT, I hope that you'll learn something new from the webinar here today. We've got a final question that you answered earlier, but I've got it later on in the webinar. So to go into our agenda, what we're going to talk about. Firstly, we're going to talk about why is biodiversity important to consider. Secondly, how to consider it in biodiversity, how to consider biodiversity in project developments. The third thing, we'll talk about the new IBAP portal, and then we've got time for questions and answers. So I'm going to hand over to Nadine. Great. Hope you can hear me okay. Yes, I can hear you, Nadine. Yeah, super. All right. So I see we've currently got 128 people on the call, which is just absolutely awesome. Um, I'm going to go through the um, the reasons of why we think biodiversity is important to consider in development projects. And I know that definitely some of you on the call now, you kind of know all this already, but it seems that some of you aren't familiar with IBAT, potentially not familiar with biodiversity. And we really see you on the call, the IAIA, which is a member of IUCN actually since last year, I really see you as potential champions for biodiversity. We need to, we see development projects not getting the, the biodiversity attention that it deserves. So I think it was worth doing a short reminder and some key statistics of why biodiversity is important to consider. So the first thing is we talk a lot about impacts and dependencies on biodiversity, creating risks but, and also opportunities for companies. And these risks tend to group around regulatory, reputational, operational. Um, and I think one interesting statistic um, comes out that over half of delays uh, to oil and gas projects are attributed to non-technical issues and social conflict over environmental resources is the biggest single factor. So already that in itself is a reason to, um, to consider biodiversity early in a project cycle. Um, and one particular case um, comes from Costa Rica that some of you may be aware of already, but um, one particular project um, uh, and a mining development, a series of uh, uh, delays over 20 years due to uh, biodiversity issues at uh, the Infinito Gold's uh, Las Crucias uh, gold mine. Um, and yeah, it just, it just shows that it, biodiversity is a real issue. In this case, it's regulatory, it's reputational, um, leading to estimated losses of 94 million US dollars. So this isn't just a... Um, and on the side, nice to have. It really has um, an impact on the bottom line. Um, but on the next slide, I just want to show that it's also about the opportunities as well. So this is a handy reminder. And those companies who take into account sustainability issues and including biodiversity as one of the benchmarks in the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability World Index shows that these companies consistently outperform their peers in the Dow Jones World Index. So we know that biodiversity by um, uh, considering biodiversity in developments as part of operations, we know that it also leads to better performing companies companies and not just about avoiding risk. And some of the other benefits um, that we tend to see associated um, when uh, addressing biodiversity through proactive risk management, there's quite a few. I mean, one of the common ones we talk about is license to operate and being able to secure um, not, uh, the social license as well as the actual uh, permitting from governments. Um, maintaining access to capital, we see uh, more and more financial institutions requesting uh, or having guidelines on biodiversity that need to be met, um, leading to very um, practical uh, reduction in operation costs, as well as um, those who are influenced by reputation and brand. And there's even uh, issues that we often hear, the companies that we work with, there's something around the staff productivity and the morale, like knowing that you're doing a good job and actually try not trashing the environment. And of course, there's some opportunities around the markets, again, depending on the supply chain. So these are a lot of the standard um, risks and opportunities that are really uh, typified now in the natural capital protocol tools that are widely available. So if you are interested to explore this area further, I really recommend that as a great starting place now where a lot of these issues have come together. So hopefully that's a useful reminder for some of you who know this already. And those of you who don't know yet why biodiversity is important, you've been uh, further convinced why this is something that you can be promoting to some of the partners that you work with. Thanks, Eugenie.
It's really interesting, Nadine, as well. Like, I think we know this intrinsically and we think, yes, yeah, so there's many reasons why um, good practice has positive opportunities. But often just seeing it like this on a slide is really useful. And that's one of the reasons also we put it up. And yeah. I tend to use it quite a bit as an, as an argument and having it there. Mm. So next, I'm going to talk about how to consider biodiversity in development projects. And I just live, like to give you a bit of background to what I did before becoming the IBAT manager. So I worked as a as a consultant with the biodiversity consultancy on a whole range of projects from site level to the corporate level. But just to talk to you about one example at the site level, I worked on a hydroelectric power plant project in Africa. Our clients had spent over 1 million US dollars on their environmental and social impact assessment, and they wanted to align with the IFC Performance Standard 6. They came to us after they'd um, finished their ESHA. And when we had a look at their ESHA, actually, we realized that they'd missed an opportunity um, there, well, an opportunity and some risk because they'd missed priority biodiversity. They hadn't done a high level biodiversity risk screening at the beginning of the project, and that would have really helped them scope out and focus down what they needed to be looking at in Asia specifically, specific, specifically for it to be um, International Finance Corporation's performance standard sex um, compliant. The screening would have identified critical habitat qualifying species and habitats in the region and this information would have definitely saved them time and saved them money and so you know a simple desktop review biodiversity risk screening desktop review would have saved them quite a bit of time and money so it's just an interesting um, case study there. So one of the things that I was involved in well, when I was at the Biodiversity Consultancy, and let's see if I can get this slide to move on, was a paper that we wrote and was published last year called The Value of IUCN, the IUCN Red List for Business Decision Making. And we thought it was really um, useful to create something that was like, right, okay, if you want to, you know, the IUCN Red List is a really important data base and that's where Nadine works. There's a whole lot of information in it and actually using it within um, business decision making can be really invaluable and there's key ways that you can do that. So we've created this diagram showing you how you can bring biodiversity data in and where you should be using it. So across the top here we have the project timeline. So imagine like a, a, a mine development project or something like that. Along the top, we have the first stage is exploration and assessment. Second, you go into initial project design, then final project design, execution, construction, and commissioning, operation, and then there's um, closure and decommissioning. The biodiversity management you need to do at these different stages, you need to firstly do biodiversity risk screening, as I mentioned in the hydroelectric power plant project, then biodiversity risk assessment, baseline surveys, they feed into the impact assessment which should be going alongside that, biodiversity action plan development when you've got the final project design in place, if you need offset then then you want to look at the offset design, monitoring and evaluation design, monitoring and evaluation implementation and then offset implementation and those through the operation and decommissioning phases. So how do I use the red list data at different parts of my project timelines? Firstly, screening sites for the potential presence of significant concentrations of priority species. So for example, whether they're being assessed as under threat of extinction, critically endangered, endangered, whether they're restricted range species, and whether they're congregatory or migratory species. So screening sites at the exploration and assessment stage. Then help use that data to inform high level design so you can avoid significant impacts on priority species so this is in the, in the initial project design phase. You want to use this data also to help focus baseline surveys to understand potential impacts on priority species. And then it'll help you also tailor appropriate mitigation and um, focus your monitoring. So the red list data that you can use at these diff different stages, firstly, you've got the assessment information. So that's whether a species, what category it's been given, so what it's been assessed as, critically endangered, endangered, etc. You can also then use at this stage the geographic range and range map. So um, IUCN has got or range maps for most species. Secondly, that's for your biodiversity risk screening. Those two 
in piece of information are vital from the red list for biodiversity risk screening. But then also there's a whole load of other information within the IUCN red list database that can be used to inform other stages of the project. And the information includes population information. The IUCN red list tells you whether a population is declining or increasing. Um, you can use habitat and ecology information, so it tells you what habitat and what ecology those species have, whether it's used or traded, and then the threats, and the threats data within the IUCN red list is, getting, is being improved all the time. So there's a whole range of information within the IUCN red list that can be used throughout the project um, life cycle and are extremely important for um, business decision making. And I've asked Bridget to send around the paper for everybody. So that's a part of the handouts that um, that Bridget will send around to everybody. So we'll go to our first poll question, please, Bridget. So our, our poll question is, are you going to say it, Bridget, or will I? Hmm. I think you, um, go for it. You, you can say it. Go for it. <laughs> so the whole question is, what is your background? Are you a consultant, government, academia or research institution? Are you from NGO or civil society, organization, private sector, business or we've added another in, in there for you? So what is your background? Just give us an idea of who's on the call today. Great. And even if you think, well, I don't really fit one of them. I mean, it's just for illustrative purposes. So just pick one. Um, we're going to keep it open for maybe half a minute or something. So if you can keep voting um, and then it's best we can kind of start tailoring how you use IBAT depending on who you are. So exactly. hopefully we're getting some good uh, responses in. And um, will you give you, will you tell us the results when they come in, Nadine, please? Yes, I'll go ahead. This is Bridget. I'll go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one, and we'll share the results so everyone can see them. Seamless. Okay, so probably unsurprisingly, so nearly half of you, 44%, are from um, consultants. Governments coming in next to 18%. That's really interesting um, to see the government representatives on this call because, again, we really see uh, the government side as also allies for getting better decision making around biodiversity uh, and development projects. So, academia research institutions, another 16%. NGOs still coming in at uh, 18%, so just about 20%. And then a tiny part actually private sector business I don't know that surprises me Eugenie does that surprise you too or? yeah well it's great to know I, I suppose it was we were saying to Bridget who do we expect to be on the call yeah. so she said we'll do a poll question and we can see so that's yeah. great yeah <laughs> yeah super. great okay. so I'll um the next poll question will we launch the next poll question yes we are great. launching it now so the next poll question is, is accessing biodiversity information a challenge for you? So is it very challenging, somewhat challenging, a little challenging, not at all challenging or not relevant for you? So is accessing biodiversity information a challenge for you? And I think, Nadine, we set this because actually, you know, from our previous work experience and our current work, you know, a lot of people tell us that it is a challenging to access biodiversity information, especially if you come from, um, I think, a, a consultant or a commercial background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's well, 75% right. have voted, 80% have voted. Should we close it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Last chance to get your vote in in three, two, one. Okay, so let's have a look at these statistics. So it looks like they're still being updated. So here we go. So we see the majority of people on this call. Okay, you're finding it challenging. Actually, there's a like ninety percent of you are finding it challenging. Um, so yes, some very challenging. A twenty percent of you are actually pretty much uh, somewhat challenging. The the large majority, um, not at all challenging. Perhaps you're using iBat already. And 2% not relevant. I'm curious why you're on this call, but you know, maybe you'll find actually that is a challenge for you uh, or less of a challenge after the webinar. So, but yeah, really hopefully when uh, the presentation shortly now on how I bat um, the, the redevelopments, uh, you'll be able to answer some of these questions that the challenges that you might have. Yeah. Thank you both. And I love this technology. It's brilliant to have this, um, the poll technology. Yeah. So the next, I'm gonna go on and talk a bit about IBAT. Um, 
and the new portal. But I suppose I want to reflect on the poll that says, yeah, people do find it challenging. So the mission for IBAT is that decisions affecting biodiversity should be informed by the best and most up-to-date scientific information. That's the main mission behind IBAT. And IBAT, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, um, has an alliance, the IBAT Alliance, and it was formed by UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center, BirdLife International, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and Cons uh, Conservation International. Did I have them all? <laughs> um, so those four partners came together and they said, right, it is challenging to access biodiversity information. And this was in 2005 was when it was first conceived. What are we going to do about it? We're going to come together, bring our, our biodiversity data together, and make it accessible for decision makers. In 2007, it was officially launched and it's been running ever since. But I think it's fair enough to say that it's pretty pretty under the radar. Um, you know, we really haven't been the best at communicating, you know, IBAT and really getting it out there and, and bringing biodiversity data um, to decision makers. But then the, the second part of our mission was to um, get decision makers to ensure that they help support the generation and, and maintenance of these data. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So two missions, um, A, getting the two sides of the mission, getting the data into the hands of decision makers and making sure the best and most up-to-date information is available. And then secondly, that decision makers are helping to generate and maintain this data. So prior to the webinar, if I can get the Thing to move on. Great. So another of our pre-webinar questions was what key improvements would you like to see in biodiversity data dissemination? And um, we got a whole range of responses and really appreciate you filling that in and sending into us. And I've pulled out um, the ones that I thought were the key ones that people had said. So A, biodiversity data needs to be trustworthy. It needs to be open source and regularly updated and I completely agree because as we know the um, threat status of species changes all the time whether because of conservation actions and so the, the category that's downgraded or whether actually a species is under more threats than it has been before. The World Database of Protected Areas is constantly updated month on a monthly basis. Um, and they aim to get data from all 200 countries at least every two years and they will go and visit the countries and help them build capacity if they're not able to update their data sets for example and then the key biodiversity areas data set is a relatively recent one and they are working on it the whole time with huge improvements over the last two years and more work to be done so these data are constantly being updated You've also said that a key improvement is linking with environmental and social safeguards, absolutely, making sure that, okay, you can um, adhere to those safeguards and be able to, okay, this data, it helps me look at, at those specific safeguards, for example. You want it to be more accessible for consultancy work, and I agree from my personal experiences. A measurement of change, which I thought was a really interesting, you know, how is biodiversity changing the ground? Do we have a measurement of that? Has deforestation been happening in the region recently? That 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 type of um, information. Also, you want the data to be consistent and transparent. You'd like classification and analysis of impact. And actually, the ISN Red List data has got threat, threat data in there, which does talk to impact. Um, you'd like a bigger number of databases available or data sets available in one tool. Very good point. Um, you'd like minimization of the misinterpretation of data. And I think that's key, actually. You know, it's one thing to say, right, this is you know critically endangered species, but actually, what does that mean? And how do you interpret that in the context of a particular project you could be working on? And then the final point was make it more affordable and easily available for commercial users. And I'll talk to that as well. So thank you everyone for that feedback. Really, really useful to get that from you. So the new IBAT portal. IBAT went through a redevelopment process over the past year, and that included then hiring me as a new IBAT manager. And um went through a big business planning process, you know, is IBAT still relevant? If it's still relevant, you know, is there, are there any changes that we should be making? Where do we want to be going with IBAT as an alliance, as those four organizations, what do we want to be doing with it? And how do we want it make, to make it more useful for um, decision makers? 
So this big um, coming together and rethinking and redevelopment said, right, we need to have a new IBAP portal. So at the moment, um, there are three different portals. One is for IBAP for business, one is IBAP for World Bank Group, another is IBAP for research and conservation. But actually, we're going to bring all three together. So all of our users will be using the one data portal, and we're completely redeveloping it so that we'll be able to do APIs, for example, and serve data um, automatically in, you know, as up to date as possible out to people if that's the way they want it. Um, that it can do um, be be used in all sorts of ways actually that it wasn't able to be used before, and bring it up to date with the new technology as well. So making sure that it doesn't become out of date. And what I'm going to show you now are wire screens, and they are what we've built. It's not yet live. There's developers coding away as we speak um, to to run it and we're going to have a soft launch in June for some of our clients to move on to it and see if it's working properly and in October there'll be a full launch of the new portal so you are the first people to see these these wire screens and what we're planning to develop and what we are in the process of developing key features are that it's a one-stop shop for protected areas key biodiversity areas and red list of species data it is the only place to access these data for commercial use. So we have a commercial use restriction on Protected Planet, on the IUCN Red List website and on the Key Biodiversity Areas website and instead directing everyone to access it from IBAT so commercial users can use it through IBAT. Other features that we have are that it can do reports. So that's where you create a PDF report for a site that you're interested in. Um, normally proximity, so you know, for example, are there any protected areas, KBAs or red listed species, critically endangered or endangered, you can choose within say a 50 or 20 kilometer buffer. And again, you can choose the buffer. So we're, you're gonna be able to do custom reports, clicking all the things that you would like to have. You're gonna be able to choose buffers, you're gonna be able to choose the types of protected areas or um, threat status of species that you want to include in your report. But also we've got ones that are bespoke for IFC Performance Standard 6 and the Global Reporting Initiative, so GRI. You're also going to be able to create a portfolio of sites, so upload sites, whether you want to upload it uh, via a KMZ or KML file or put them onto the map yourself, and I'll show you that. And you'll be able to download data directly from the source. So I'm just showing you some of the key features that I knew would be interesting from my my perspective as a consultant and downloading data directly was a key thing that we wanted to do and then we pulled the data into our own GIS system we're able to overlay the project infrastructure for example and do analyses through our own um, system that we wanted to do so you'll go in and you'll be able to see my sites and reports is one button the go directly if I want to go directly into the data map I can if I just want to go directly to data downloads because that's all I'm interested in just get in and out get the data out pull it into my GIS um, system and then analyze it or country profiles which is a feature that we've um, it specifically for government users actually so the government users on the call now where you can look at your country and the statistics around those three data sets for your country at the below those buttons you can see that there'll be my sites and so you can see any sites that you've uploaded previously will be listed there including their overlap with protected areas their overlap with say critically endangered species and their overlap with kbas and you'll be able to go and view more details on that if you want here is the data map and you can see that locations will be added in if you've already added locations in. You can add your own location, you can zoom down, it'll be a Google type style map um, but it's from a different uh, data source actually. You'll be able to type in here up in this text box in the um, top left corner where it says location, it says England, London at the moment. You'll be able to start typing, so I'm in Cambridge at the moment, as I start typing Cambridge in it'll say Cambridge uh, US or Cambridge UK and I'll say Cambridge UK and I'll zoom in into Cambridge. So this is the, the data map and on that as well you'll be able to click on and off layers the protected areas data, the KBAs data and the IUCN red list of species um, and we're also looking at bringing in other data layers so when we talked about interpreting data and misinterpretation of data which was someone's point earlier on we are going to bring in um, other data layers which will help you interpret the, the biodiversity data that we have in there. 
Other things we'll add are like critical habitat map from Marine was created here in UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre. We'll be adding that as well as critical habitat map for uh, terrestrial and you know other data sets hopefully will be added as we go through time. But the key ones, get the key ones in there first and get them in a in a way that are really usable. Then to show you a site, the site screen or the site page. Here it will have the, the site name at the top and the coordinates and the location. It will have a map and show you the, the your site, whatever you've put in there. It might be a polygon or just a point and it will show you against the protected areas and key biodiversity areas data. It will then also show you how many species you're overlapping with from the IUCN red list and then which category they're from. So here we just put some data in, so five critically endangered species, 10 endangered, 25 vulnerable. And then below you will also have the overlap with protected areas and the overlap with key biodiversity areas. This is the, the site um, page and from this you'll be able to create a new report and in the report you can you'll create a P PDF report and it will give you much more information um, and detail on exactly which species you're overlapping with, uh, which protection areas you're overlapping with, which key biodiversity areas you're overlapping with and further detail so for example if you're overlapping with KBAs what was the trigger species for the KBAs. Um, so there's a huge amount of information in the back end within the three databases, so really bringing the most out of those and so people can access the full data they need. A data download is particularly useful for consultants who say, well, actually, I just want to go in and download the data myself into my own GIS system. You will be able to draw a polygon, so click on a, an area, so say for example, the project I worked on in Africa, be able to click on the river and say, right, um, draw my polygon for my site and then be able to download the data for the specific area I want, pull it into my own GIS system and then able to do the analysis in my own GIS system. That was a lot of the, the work that we did for biodiversity risk screening in my previous job. You'll also be able to do a full data download and this has been requested by quite a few people and to give you an example TomTom Tom, the SatNav company are a new subscriber for IBAT and they wanted to bring the world database of protected areas into TomTom Tom SatNavs so now as Bridget drives across America on her holidays she'll be able to see protected areas, nature reserves, national parks as she drives by. So they will be using this page or using an, an API and they'll be downloading the full World Database Protection Areas um, probably on a, on a regular basis and pulling it into their own systems. So pricing for IBAT. So because we've pulled the three IBAT portals which we had before into one, it's going to be free to um, access country profiles, um, so for the government users. It, there'll be to access the visual map to displaying protected areas, key biodiversity areas, size and red list species will be free. And then if you want to do a bespoke report, you pay as you go. If you want to download data, you do a pay as you go. And the other thing you'll also be able to do is save sites within the free profile. And downloading reports and downloading data will vary from about 100 US dollars to um, a few thousand US dollars, depending on the amount of data that you're looking for. So if you're just looking for a small site and looking for a report, then that's looking at you know the kind of 100, 100 US dollar level. But if you want to look at a data for quite a large area and you want to download it into your system, then that will cost more. More. Then if you're an annual sus subscriber, which is actually more the private sector will be doing that, so um, financial institutions or oil and gas companies or automotive industry, etc., they will be using the annual subscriptions. So the basic is 5,000 US dollars. You'll have access to a full site catalog, upload and saving points and unlimited proximity reports at the moment. Um, the pro will be 15 or is 15,000 US dollars and you'll have limited downloads in that and then unlimited reports again at the moment. Um, and then the final bit, uh, final um, subscription level is enterprise and you can have through that unlimited downloads of protected areas, key biodiversity areas, IUCN red listed species, for example. So the key one that consultants will be using to access IBAT will be the download reports using pay-as-go, um, yeah, 
And what I've done is I've, I've been rethinking the pricing on this. So it did start at a very high cost and I've brought the pricing right down because we want to make it accessible and affordable for uh, consultants and make sure that everyone can have access to this data. So I'd really appreciate any feedback you have at different stages on the, on the pricing there. And then, of course, you know, why why do we charge for the data at all? Why not make it free for everybody to access it? There was a recent work done by a colleague of mine here at UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre, Diego Hufe Bignoli, and he went and he looked at the cost of uh, generating and maintaining and upkeeping these global data sets. So specifically the IBAT data sets, protected areas, KBAs and red listed species. And he went back through all the costs of maintaining these and came up with a, an estimation of 6.5 million US dollars to 14 million US dollars per year to upkeep these, these data sets. There's a huge amount of cost involved, a huge amount of work behind them. So the 6.5 is if we just kept maintained what we have. The 14 million is actually, well, we haven't red listed um, various taxonomic groups. So let's start really expanding our red list. Um, let's keep the red lists that we have at the moment as up to date as possible. But also let's think about like the, the red list of ecosystems, for example. So that's why there's a cost um, with IBAT. So, to try and re recoup some of the costs that the four organizations put into updating um, these databases. Yeah. And then I've just pulled out some quotes from our users um, that we've been doing a lot of interviews recently and really understanding why they use it, what it's useful for, etc. So, here a colleague from Mott McDonald said IBAT is a must for any project on biodiversity conservation. They use it a lot in their um, ESHA type work. Again, high level risk screening is what they use it for. Here's a quote from Conrad Savvy at the International Finance Corporation is that IBAC gives us access to experts on data and biodiversity that we can't get anywhere else. And again, I suppose we have IUCN um, behind IBAT, we have UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre, BirdLife International and Conservation International. And our aim is to keep that data as up to date as possible and to help that make sure that the interpretation of the data is as good as possible. Uh, Paolo Maria Pedroni from ENI, making a real contribution to the management of biodiversity issues within our oil and gas operations worldwide. And then Stephen Dickinson from Total said that it's invaluable to them and their projects for optimal biodiversity management. So just a, a quick um, overview of some of our users and other users include General Motors, Nespresso, TomTom Tom, as I mentioned, um, Swedish Export Credit Agency. So a wide range of people are using IBAT for mainly for high level level risk screening. So I think if we're happy we'll um, move over to questions Nadine. Yeah, we've got a few questions in already, but this is also a moment just to encourage all 147 of you right now, if you've got other questions, um, and we'll see, um, we've got quite a bit of time, actually, we've got about 40 minutes now, uh, 20 minutes now to the end of the webinar, so there should be a chance to, you know, answer some of the questions and, um, yeah, provide some further information for those who need it. Um, so maybe just to, to kick off, so some of the questions have come in. Um, forgive my pronunciation, but I think it's Zhu, um, ZHU is asking, just to clarify, does the I, does IBAT must be used on a GIS, GIS platform? No, no. So IBAT itself is its own online platform. From the online platform itself, you can do loads of things. You can do your reports. You can look at uh, what's in the proximity of my site, for example. Um, so it's a whole system itself, actually. So you don't need to go near a uh, GIS, your own GIS platform. Uh, you can do most of the functionality in IBAT itself. We've got three types of users. We've got one user who uses the portal and does everything on that. We've got another user who often consultants who will pull the data into their own GIS system and then do analyses from there. And then we've got a third user like TomTom Tom, who pull all the data into things like, like SatNavs. But the portal itself, uh, you can use it for a whole range of things. It, it does everything you, you, you know, we can think that people need it to do. So yeah, you don't need to pull data into the GIS system. Thanks for that okay. question, Jay. 
Super. Okay. So questions are coming in, flying in right now. There's a couple of questions from Ahmad in Iran. So he was asking, um, how do the overlapping maps work? I guess um, I guess he's asking, like, how do we incorporate different maps together? Mm -hmm. And then also, how can we detect endangered biodiversity in toxic hotspots was his terminology, yep. the critical spots. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, with the overlapping maps, and we're still thinking about how is the best way to do that. But at the moment on the current IBAT portal, because there is a current IBAT portal, you're able to turn on and off the layers. So if I wanted to have all protected layers on, protected areas layer, the layer on, or actually I can choose just to have, say, IUCN category one to three protected areas on. I can turn those on and off. I can do that also for key biodiversity areas, for um, AZE, Alliance for Zero Extinction layers. So I can turn on and off those layers. We're working to see, is there any way to make the interpretation of these even better by turning on, you know, in the ways that you can turn on and off the layers. But that's a basic thing at least you will be able to do and that you currently can do in IBAN. And then detecting, um, say, endangered biodiversity. Well, you will, the high level of biodiversity risk screening. So if you have a site and you say, okay, this is my site where I've got some, um, is it, toxic issues going on, is that what you were saying, Ahmed? Mm -hmm. That you are able to drop your um, your pin onto your site area, and then you're able to query IBAT and say, right, within a 10, 20, 30 kilometer radius, you choose the radius that you want or the buffer you want. What critically endangered biodiversity am I going to find there? So you could say, yeah, critically endangered species or endangered species, you can actually choose. And then you can generate a report to show you what biodiversity at the, at the level that we have in our databases we think is in the area. So I hope that answers your question, Ahmed. Right. Okay. There are so many questions coming in. This is really awesome. Maybe an easy one that a couple of people have asked, um, Eddie, uh, and I can't see where the other question is now. But in terms of language, is there is it available just in English, or are the other is it going to be translation? Especially if we want government to access and use this website, the different languages would be essential. That's from Catherine as well. So two questions. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie and Catherine. That's a really good question. So. In terms of accessing through other languages, at the moment, you can generate reports in Spanish and iPad, and we want to be able to do that as a minimum this year. So this year is about redeveloping the portal so that it is modern and up to date. And then next year, I'm going to focus on some other key improvements. And I think that that should really be focusing on language. So be really, after the webinar, if you could send any feedback to Bridget around oh, which languages would be really useful to you have. And um, we can do a simple thing where we can translate the website easily um, through Google Translate, etc. But then it's the reports that are key, I think, in having them in different languages. So any any feedback on then would be on that would be really okay. useful. Okay. So I'm going to group a few questions here now specifically on the type of data that's available. So some uh, Mahoud, Mahmoud is asking about connectivity analysis. Mm -hmm. There's another question on um, non-spatial red list data like threats, pollution and information. Yep. And a third one is in population genetic data. And so are there any plans to include this at the moment or in the future? Yes, great, great questions. So I'm trying to think, oh yes, the, ra the la layer that we're going to pull in is called range rarity. And that layer is where scientists from our organizations have come together and said, how can we make better use of the three data sets? Um, the range rarity layer is a really interesting layer and will help you understand actually where what is more important for biodiversity. It's not specifically connectivity, but it will say like, say in this two kilometer area or 50 kilometer area, whatever you're interested in, actually that is holding you know, four or five endemic species are not found anywhere else. So that was the, the range rarity layer we're going to bring in. And, and it does give, give some information around connectivity as well in that context. In terms of non-spatial um, IUCN red list data, again in the reports. So it'll pull out, right, all these species are within your, so maybe the buffer you created was 20 kilometers. These species overlap with your polygon that you've created and these are these critically endangered species, these endangered species, etc. And then it will also tell you we're going to pull data from the IUCN Red List database, the non-spatial data, tell you if that population is increasing or decreasing. Um, hopefully we can pull out the data like what threats it's under, etc. So I'm going to try and pull more of that non-spatial data out and make sure that the full interpretation of that data is available to IBAT users. And then population genetics, if there's any information within the IUCN red list, then that will be, be pulled out as well. 
or at least we will redirect people. Okay, if you need more information on this species, redirect them to the IUCN website and they can see more information on that species itself. Okay, and actually just another type of data. So what about, there's a question from Robert Langstroth, um, we'll be able to identify restricted range species as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll be pulling that out because that's a key um, I, IFC PS6 um, criterion, um, restricted range species. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so another question, oh, actually from Robert as well. I didn't spot this, Robert Langstroth. So he's asking, will the IBAT new portal be able to show cumulative impacts such as multiple projects disputing over same site resources? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Gosh, cumulative impacts is such a big thing and something that we really need to be looking at in general as a community. So everybody here on the webinar today and beyond uh, is a serious issue. Unfortunately, I'd say really what IBAC can do is I'd really like more of the threat data pulled out so you can understand what the threats and actually whether the project that um, you're particularly interested in or other ones in the area are going to have an impact on it. Um, the other thing that we have developed and is actually in the current portal is you can say uh, a hydroelectric power plant, you can say, this is my river and I want to know, are there any critically endangered and endangered species upstream and downstream of my site? So we've brought um, hydro sheds and hydro basins data um, into the portal and so you can do a query specifically on that or a report specifically on that so that addresses the connectivity question and it also addresses a little bit the cumulative impact so you know that it's going to if there's other things happening on that river there's going to be cumulative impacts. Mm. And actually maybe a, perhaps a bit linked to that is a question from John Connell so how can I but add value to long linear sites that might cross very large areas like pipelines or roads? John, great question. And this has been a functionality that people have been looking for in IBAT um, for a long time. So instead of just being able to do a dot, you're now going to be able to draw polygons and you can be able to draw a linear polygon if you want. So if you're interested in a pipeline and just say, you know, even you know one kilometre buffer either side of that pipeline or 500 metre buffer outside that pipeline, you'll be able to do that. So you'll finally be able to look at um, linear sites as well. Yeah. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions from people from different parts of the world saying, how do I know what data is available in my part of the world, especially if it's a remote mm -hmm. part of the world, like in Russia, Suriname, or somebody saying Brazil, there's biodiversity everywhere. So how, yeah. how can um, yeah people find out what data is available before having to pay for it? Yeah, well, so the free... Uh, version will have a lot of information in it anyway so we'll give as much metadata as we can you'll be able to interact with the maps and query the maps and turn things on and off as well so you'll be able to turn on and off the key biodiversity areas layers and objective areas layers you need to have a little bit of think about how the IUCN red list of species is in there but I'd say at the, at the minimum we will have this range rarity layer which is bringing the IUCN red list data and talking to connectivity range rarity etc so that that will all be within the free level. Once you want to start doing things like specific reports for specific sites or downloading data into your own system, you'll need to pay for that. But the basic level, be able to view and interrogate data, you'll be able to do that for free. Yeah, super. Okay. Um, and somebody's asking, uh, uh, this is an Irish name, Tag, T A D H G, Tag. Tag. Um, is there a manual associated for actually being able to use the iBet? Do we have a user manual? A user manual, that's a great idea, Tyke. <laughs> I'm going to put that down on my uh, to-do list. Yeah. yeah, I want to not only have a user manual, I want it to be super user-friendly. So along the way, and again, around interpreting biodiversity information, as you're using it, it is telling you, okay, how to interpret different things, what you can do next, etc. And I'm also going to then do short videos. So really, really short videos, how to do this, how to do the other. So a user manual, definitely but I think in many different ways we can communicate that um, and not just in a typical say PDF manual but videos um, little interactive things on the portal itself yeah okay super so there's a couple of questions around like data accuracy so um, uh, Pauline I don't know who's asking this one who how do we deal with gaps in the data and then also um, another question saying you know we, we have, there's a lot of data within the organizations that are using IBAT how can they input that into um, IBAT so data accuracy and I'll just write this down data accuracy is always an issue um, we 
well, firstly, we're going to have a, if you see that there's any data that you know is inaccurate, um, a feedback button so you can quickly click and say, right, there's an issue here. And then we will be able to tackle it at our end. Again, the whole point of iBAD is A, you know, people using it, but then the um, subscriptions, any subscriptions coming in help to improve the data. So we are constantly in the process of updating the data. So anyone who notices an inaccuracy in the data that gets fed back into the system, and we try to deal with it as soon as we possibly can. But there are always inaccuracies in the data. I suppose when we're dealing with biodiversity and we're dealing with you know the vastness of it, um, it's a constant struggle. But at the moment, those three databases are the most authoritative and up-to-date and accurate biodiversity data that is available globally. Um, dealing with gaps, though, if you think, well, look, there just really isn't much data in this area, well, I suppose it's, you know, a, a caution approach, take caution, you know, IBAT doesn't mean that, you know, just because it doesn't show a species isn't there doesn't mean it it, it, it definitely um, isn't there, <laughs> or that if IBAT um, shows a species is there, it doesn't mean it definitely is there. So this is always high level. It's a first step, but there's a whole lot of other steps that need to come afterwards, including on the ground field surveys. Um, yeah. So the gaps really is about is about getting down on the ground. A letting us know we'll keep our data as up to date as we possibly can, and any subscriptions really help with that. But then um, getting on the ground is nothing like it. And then data input. So we're looking at what data can come into IBAT at the moment. Um, but then also, if you're just within an organisation, you want to have the one thing you can put up at the moment will be input your own sites, and you'll be able to upload a shape file to input your own sites into IBAT. Yeah, and actually just from personal experience, been involved in IBAT um, quite a lot last year before Eugenie came on board. Um, there's also inherent in like the hundreds of thousands of data sets in the protected planet and the key biodiversity areas um, that sometimes there's been um, a mix up in the data and sometimes it's like a shrinking of a polygon or a wrong unit or a just a slightly different um, uh, location. And so I think what we're also trying to generate through IBAT is like a user community, like we all care about having the best biodiversity data. So it's also great if you do spot something there'll also be a feedback mechanism where you're able to flag these issues um, if you spot potential inaccuracy and we can also also improve the data as well um, so as some people are saying yeah well uploading data you know it's free do we get paid for doing that well not really it's about trying to build up the community of data together um, so there is a question around data assurance metric though from Amrud again so is there any form of data assurance um, that's, a, that? that's a really good question um <laughs> the, um I'm thinking <laughs> well I think what we what we do guarantee is that the data is the 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 best that that we have that it's as most as up to date as we can make it um I want to also pull out into it well when was that species last assessed for example so if you can see that a species was assessed quite a long time ago you can go mm, you know maybe that's not as accurate as I think it should be or but if a species was assessed really recently it will help you understand the accuracy of the data that's there before you yeah yeah okay I think it's something for us to think about isn't it Nadine Absolutely, yeah. Um, so actually just a couple of people are asking, is it possible to use IBAT now? Um, and then, and how would they do that if I wanted to see information, for example, in St. Lucia? Um, so yeah, so you just want to clarify that? Yeah, well, I think on my next slide, there we are. Um, this is our URL, it's ibat-alliance.org. If you go to that at the moment, you'll be able to access the three different IBATs, IBAT for business if you're a commercial user, IBAT for World Bank Group if you are from a financial institute, and then IBAT for research and conservation if you're a government user or a researcher from a university, for example. And you can access um, basically everything that I've shown you in the webinar today. It's going to look different. And it's going to look more old fashioned than what I've shown you, but this is all usable and accessible now at the moment. Yeah. So yeah, when somebody's asking, are the free accounts available online now? The yeah, through the research and conservation planning website, is that yeah, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you're a commercial user, um, go to IBAT for Business. Um, we are implementing the account structure at the moment, so even in IBAT for Business, you'll be able to access a certain level for free. 
Yeah. So just to clarify on the timeline, a question coming in. So the new tool, like in the the new format, will be launched already in October. But you can use the existing iBat um, through that link already. So just the question, just in from Melissa there. Okay. Goodness me. There's a lot of questions. Uh, I'm not sure, Bridget, how we're going to conquer all of these questions in the time that we've got left. Let's see. Um, some other. You're doing questions. great job, Nadine. <laughs> ah, thank you. It's challenging my multitasking. Uh, um, Oh, so yeah, a few people are asking around pricing structures, especially mm -hmm. for NGOs or how can they access the data or, um, in African countries? Um, so how, how can they access the, the data as well? Yeah, so if you're an NGO and say you're only specifically interested in red list data, actually you can go to the IUCN red list website. If you want to download the data, you'll be taken through a series of questions um, and then you'll be directed to the right place for that. So you can go to um, Protected Planet, the IUCN red list website and Key Biodiversity Areas website um, to access the data. As soon as possible, I'll have the new account structure in place on the IBAT Alliance. So actually, you'll be able to go into IBAT for Business and be able to access, everybody will, a certain level of the data for free in any case. Yeah, so you've got two options as a, a research conservation government user. Either go to the three websites or come to the IBAT Alliance website. Yeah, super. So, Eddie, that was your question about public participation in EIA. So, hopefully, that answers it um, to go through the separate um, uh, structures for the different um, knowledge data sets. Okay. And then there was a specific question um, on anticipated fee structures for the API access mentioned yes. earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to do API, um, and that's what, so for example, Tom, Tom are doing at the moment, they'll be using an API. At the do moment, you want to say what API is for those who don't know? Oh, I don't even know what the acronym stands oh, for. <laughs> it's something, um, it's so that you can, basically it's a way for computers to talk to other computers or yeah. websites to other yeah. websites. Um, so it'll pull the data in automatically to your own system, for example, or yeah. That's what it is. So it's a, it, I think it's a piece of like message area or code or something like that. Um, you can tell I'm not an informatics person, but the API will be at the moment. It's about it's twenty five thousand to thirty five thousand US dollars per year um, to be able to pull all of the world database from protected areas key biodiversity areas and or IUCN red list species into it. Um, so it's the large, to tend to be the large users who are using the API at the moment. But if you are a smaller user and you'd like to look at an API, please get in contact with me. Okay. And so last grouping of questions is kind of more practically what, what comes out of IBAT. So if we've got a site, you know, can you, how do we, um, how do we get a list uh, of species related to a certain buffer area? Um, can IBAT identify also the indirect area influenced by a project? Uh, are, are maps or graphs also uh, available? Um, and uh, does it generate a report that we're able to use later in publication? Something like that. So it's a grouping of questions about what comes out of IBAT. Great question. So on the site page, it will show you, you've dropped a site and it will show you, according to the buffers that you've chosen, um, on the site web page, it will show you graphs and maps of your site against protected areas, key biodiversity areas and red listed species. So that's on the site itself. And then you can click for a report and a report is a PDF. And so that PDF report is something that you can download and then share with your colleagues or pull data out from, etc. Um, and you can decide on the buffers that you want in your PDF report as well. And then you and you can do it bespoke, so say, I'm particularly interested, well, it will always have a map on the top of it, your PDF report. Um, and a lot of people have asked that we that they want a map that they can be able to copy and paste into their own their own reports, which is a really good point and a use that everyone wants from it. So yeah, it will have a full list of species in your PDF report um, that are overlapped, and it will sort them according to whether they're critically endangered, endangered, um, endemic, for example, migratory, congregatory um, species, mm -hmm. um, maps, graphs. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Yeah, super. Okay, so there's still a ton of questions. So um, I think we have to hand over to Bridget just for the final uh, piece and she can tell us how we're actually going to deal with these remaining questions. But just to say thank you to Peace and Delia for saying API is application programming interface. Aha, 
learn something Great. new. All right, Bridget, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Eugenie and Nadine, for a great presentation. Thank you all for participating and submitting such great questions. Uh, we'll, we'll chat offline and, and figure out how best uh, Eugenie and Nadine want to handle these, if uh, how we can best address them so that you guys can all get the information that you're looking for. Uh, so, but we do need to wrap up because we want to be respectful of your time. And so, uh, Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Uh, as I said before, in a day or two, you will get a link in an email to the recording, as well as the link to the slides and the handout that Eugenie mentioned earlier. Also, I encourage you as you leave, please take a moment to complete a short survey um, when you exit. It provides information as feedback to us at IAIA. Also, uh, there are some questions related to IBAT, and I know Eugenie and Nadine are really keen to get your responses on those as well, so that will help them as they go forward and develop. So thank you for taking the time in advance to fill that out as you leave. Um, we also do have some other biodiversity related resources on IAIA's webpage, and you'll see them there on the screen with the URL there for our publications page. We have most recently a key citation key citation series on biodiversity on six different topic areas. So you want to check that out. That's pretty recent. We also, if you want something quick and easy to digest, we have a fast tip series. It's a two page piece of paper that has the basics on that topic, five important things to know, five important things to do. Um, and we do have two fast tips publications related to biodiversity. If you want to dig a little deeper, we have um, some uh, best practice principles in biodiversity as well. And then I would be remiss if I did not mention that IAIA recently held a symposium in Washington, D.C. and on the topic of biodiversity and mainstreaming the mitigation hierarchy and impact assessment. So we do have many of those presentations that have been submitted to us and they are available on our website as well. So one final thank you to Eugenie and Nadine. It was a great engaging presentation and to all of you for being here. We know that your time is valuable and we hope you found this valuable as well. See you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.